Hello everyone, and welcome to AISC's Night School, Steel Construction from the Mill to Topping Out, presented by multiple speakers, including tonight's presenter, Drew Torek of Ruby & Associates. Today is October 15, 2018, and this is Session 1, Introduction to the Steel Construction Process, presented by Drew Torek. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating this evening's presentation. I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Drew Torek. Drew Torek is a project manager with Ruby & Associates Incorporated, structural engineers of Bingham Farms, Michigan. He leads the firm's construction engineering group and has over 10 years of experience. His experience includes specialized work in connection design, heavy lifting and rigging, erection procedure and stability analysis, as well as industrial steel design and detailing. Drew is an active in the professional industry groups and served locally as a treasurer for the SEA of Michigan. He is a member of ASCE as well as AISC. Drew is a licensed professional in Michigan and Ohio, as well as a licensed structural engineer in Illinois. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Drew, thanks for being here, and I'll hand things over to you. All right, thanks Brent. Good evening, everyone. As Brent said, my name is Drew Torek. Um, he gave a pretty good professional bio, but I wanted to take just a moment to let you know a little bit more about myself personally. Um, as he said, I went to Rose Holman Institute of Technology, uh, engineering school in central Indiana. And growing up in Indiana, I followed IndyCar racing and the Chicago Cubs. But now that I live outside of Detroit, I'm a Tigers fan too which is okay because they're in different leagues. Um, I am the treasurer for CME and really enjoy that organization. I've got two adorable boys and I'm the Cub Scout assistant den leader for one of them. And one of the highlights of my last summer was on a family camping trip in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I was able to take a trip to the top of the Mackinac Bridge to uh, look at a project that we designed. So that was tons of fun. As Brent said, this is Night School 18, and I just wanted to provide a slide showing the uh, different presentations that we have planned for you. Today's pr presentation is an introduction to kind of all of the different uh, parts of the Night School. So we've got manufacturing of structural steel shapes, uh, steel fabrication process, uh, connection design, a presentation from the erector, and one from an erection engineering professional engineer. Then we finish the night school with field fixes and with quality control. This is my outline for this evening. I'd like to talk about the team uh, in general and how the members of the team relate to one another. And then I'll go through a section uh, describing each of the members, how they relate to the other members, what their responsibilities are, and what kind of things that they uh, do to make the steel building a possibility. So we'd start with a jumble of all the different members that make up the team, and we end up in the end with one nice steel building. But how are those members arranged? It's hard to say what a typical contractual arrangement is, but this is a potential arrangement as envisioned by the Code of Standard Practice. In the real world, it can vary quite a bit based on the preferences of the owner, construction manager, fabricator, and the rest of the team. But in this design bid build scenario, the owner contracts with the architect for the design services, and the engineer of record and other designers are underneath the architect's umbrella. The owner also contracts with the construction manager for all of the field services. The fabricator usually holds the contract for the connection designer, the detailer, and the erector, but like I said, it's hard to say what is typical. Another common scenario is a design bid, design build arrangement where the owner holds one contract with the construction manager and all of the design services are under his umbrella um, as well as all the field services that we discussed earlier. Another contractual arrangement that we've been exploring in our office is a design detail method. Uh, in this 
contract, the connection design is actually brought forward and the detailing underneath the engineer of records contract. This lets the EOR, the connection designer, and the detailer remain in very close contact early on in the process. I can shorten the schedule uh, by producing shop drawings sooner and reduces the number of RFIs that are created in that process. The detailer then provides the fabrication or the approval documents or fab details to the fabricator once he is on board. However, the Code of Standard Practice cautions that this method of delivery shifts many responsibilities of the fabricator onto other parties such as the EOR, and this requires extra communication in the contract documents. Other ways that buildings can be contracted may be in a fast track project where the construction is started in the field before the design is even complete. Especially on large projects where very long duration uh, schedules in the field are typical, the design may not be complete on the upper levels of the structure, but the contractors are already pouring foundations, and even erecting the lower levels of steel. The design may be more conservative at the front end because the final loads and the final arrangements of the upper steel aren't completely known. But because the schedule can be shortened, the occupancy uh, can be a little earlier in the process, and then the owner can start generating revenue. Additionally, the Code of Standard Practice identifies a design fab methodology where the fabricator both designs and fabricates the building. This is typical for metal building systems, such as a butler building or a new core building. I've been mentioning the Code of Standard Practice, so let me introduce that formally. AISC 303 is the Code of Standard Practice for Steel Buildings and Bridges. The Code of Santa Practice defines the criteria for the trade practices involved in steel buildings. Essentially, the code identifies who is responsible for what in the steel construction team. The Code of Standard Practice has enough information and enough um, relationships within it to serve as the document that all the parties can reference to know what their uh, particular job is on the steel team, but the contract or the code may be modified by contract documents if there are different relationships between the parties. What is structural steel? Well, first I'd like to point out the top corner of my slide has a code reference to section 2.1. Anytime I show some text up here, that's either for the code of standard practice or it's a reference to another document that's, that will be noted. Section 2.1 of the code defines structural steel as the elements of the structural frame that are shown and sized in the structural design documents that are essential to support design loads. Normally these are furnished by the fabricator and they include things that you know and love such as beams, columns, bracing, and leveling plates. Um, a number of items on this list can be provided if they are attached to the structural frame or if they're made from structural shapes such as girts or door frames or purlins. And conversely, what is not structural steel? Section 2.2 of the code uh, provides a long list of items that may be furnished by the fabricator if contracted to do so, but unless it's otherwise noted, this is not considered structural steel. Things like cables or castings, flags pull support, gratings, or handrail. And again, see the Code of Standard Practice for the entire list of what is not structural steel. Now I'll focus for a few slides on the owner and architect. I'm grouping these two together because they work very closely at the outset of the building concept to determine the size, configuration, and performance criteria for the building. The owner has the main responsibility to determine the contract arrangement based on the members of the team that he wants to bring aboard and how he'd like them to perform. And of course, he'll pay for the building. The architect provides life safety, uh, including occupancy loading, exits, circulation, 
and selects finishes such as the doors, uh, door and window schedule, ceiling and floor coverings, etc. I point out that the owner needs to pay for the building because an engineer's estimate can be a good guess as to the final cost of the structure. But the more early input that the owner can get from the contractors who will actually perform the work, the more accurate the price will be. As we'll see in a moment, having this input early can help to provide a more cost-efficient final design. Other trades who might be in the architect's team are a civil designer, an electrical, an HVAC, and a plumbing engineer. So I'd like to introduce the concept of constructability. Constructability of steel, structural steel buildings is a big enough topic that AISC has produced a design guide on the subject. Quoting from that design guide, the Construction Industry Institute defines constructability as the optimum use of construction knowledge and experience in planning, procurement, and field operations to achieve overall project objectives. So the two graphs on this page illustrate that the ability to influence the cost and quality of a construction project is much higher at the, in the early stages of the project and diminishes greatly as the project uh, progresses. And conversely, on the left, the cost of change starts out small, but as documents are produced and fabrication and erection begins, the cost of change grows exponentially. Constructability can be looked at along this timeline. After construction documents are released and bids come back higher than estimated, an owner might begin a process of value engineering to try and adjust the project scope to contain costs. This is not constructability. The owner might decide to bring in some input before construction documents are issued in a constructability review session. This is not constructability. Constructability really happens throughout the entire design and construction cycle of the building. Quoting again from the design guide, constructability seeks to integrate the design and construction process and reap the benefits of collaboration. It is an approach that infuses construction knowledge and experience into the design process, creating a project that achieves the overall project objectives while reducing costs, improving the schedule, and eliminating litigation. The best way that you can provide constructability on your project is by understanding the responsibilities of all the members of the steel construction team. This AISC Night School series will help you to be aware of the different needs of each party and the different capabilities of each party, and hopefully foster early communication to make your project more successful. Now I'd like to describe the responsibilities of the ODRD. The owner's designated representative for design, as noted in the coder standard practice, is commonly referred to as the engineer of record. So I'll use that convention through the rest of the presentation. The EOR is responsible for the structural adequacy of the design. And this, of course, means using the building codes and requirements for each of the materials to produce a building that meets the code. The EOR is responsible for producing contract documents. These documents define the responsibility of parties involved in the bidding, fabricating, and erecting of structural steel. The diagram shows that the contract documents are made up of a set of specifications, which is the por portion of the contract documents that consists of written requirements for materials, standards, and workmanship, and the contract itself. Additionally, the structural design documents or are made up of either the design drawings or, where parties have agreed, the design model. A combination of drawings and digital models may also be provided. This distinction between design drawings and design model as representations of the design documents is new in the 2016 edition of the Code of Standard Practice. The engineer of record will typically release documents in several phases. 
and structural design, they will work back and forth with the owner and architect to come up with rough designs to help develop the final scope of the project and rough cost estimates. Sometimes many iterations of the analysis options are reviewed to determine the most efficient for the project. In design development, engineering design begins in earnest, and this set of documents is usually issued in sets to coordinate with the owner, the architect, and other trades, such as the mechanical and the electrical, as the design is firmed up. A mill order is sometimes issued by the engineer of record prior to construction documents, so the fabricator can begin to source steel directly from the mill, and I'll describe this in more detail later. Finally, the construction documents are ready to be issued. This is a bid set. At this point, the design should be complete with all the information that the fabricator and the erector need to provide accurate and complete bids to the owner. Any revisions issued after the construction documents are released must be clearly communicated to all parties and may affect work that has already begun. The Coder Standard Practice lists a few basic requirements that all the design documents should provide. I'm not going to read the list, but I'll point out that information required by AISC 341, the seismic specification, includes such information as the designation of the seismic force resistant system, locations and dimensions of protected zones, notch toughness requirements, as well as many other items. The design documents also need to provide any special limitations, any special fabrication or erection tolerances, and any architecturally exposed structural steel, or AESS, requirements. Design documents must also contain connection design information, and there are three options for providing this, more later in the presentation. Additionally, the construction team must know what the lateral force resisting system is so that they can coordinate the various trades necessary to ensure a stable structure during construction. The lateral force resisting system may be made up of steel and non-steel elements such as metal deck, concrete diaphragm, masonry shear walls, precast panels, open web joist, cold form products, and many other things that are not structural steel but provide for the stability of a steel structure. An example of the lateral force resisting system definition statements are provided in the commentary to section 7.10.1. I've included one here. It might be a little bit small on the screen, but you have it in your handouts, and you can certainly read it in the coder standard practice on your own. This is just an example so that you can see it only needs to be a few sentences to describe a typical building, but it's still a vital piece of information that the code requires on a set of design documents. Finally, the design documents need to provide any criteria required for a specialty structural engineer to perform his task. Things such as loads, deflection, and performance requirements for joists or proprietary connections would be included in this bullet point. Now we'll describe some of the responsibilities of the ODRC. The ODRC is the owner's designated representative for construction. This might be a general contractor or a construction manager. I'll probably refer to it as, as a CM in this project. The ODRC is responsible for the overall construction of the project, including its planning, quality, and completion. The ODRC maintains the latest contract documents and keeps the information flowing, as well as information for, as well as requests for information between the various parties, and the ODRC manages the construction budget. Section 7 in the Code of Standard Practice on Erection provides a number of uh, items that the ODRC is responsible to provide before the erector can begin his portion of the project. The ODRC needs to maintain adequate access for material delivery, a dry flat site for the erector to work, adequate storage for material laydown and shakeout. If these type of uh, 
accesses can't be provided for whatever reason, if the project site is too tight or the schedule is, is such that the space needs to be utilized elsewhere, the actual job site conditions must be made known at the time of bidding so that the erector knows what he's getting into and can price the project accordingly. The ODRC is also responsible for prep work, foundations, setting lines and benchmarks, and installing anchor bolts. Once the erector arrives on site, he'll typically place columns on shims or leveling nuts until the structure is connected and plumbed up. Placing grout, grout underneath the base plates is a separate trade that must be coordinated by the ODRC. Now I'd like to discuss how that steel is manufactured in the first place. The steel mill is responsible for transforming new raw materials into new steel, controlling the chemistry and rolling shapes suitable for steel construction. The mill uses iron or scrap steel to produce new shapes, and the distinction between iron and steel is that iron has more than 2% carbon and steel has less than 1% carbon. Structural steels are typically around or less than a quarter of a percent carbon. Steel for structural shape production in the United States is virtually entirely made in an electric arc furnace. This might be referred to as a mini mill. The mini mill takes small batches made using mostly scrap steel to produce new steel products. Because it's a little bit smaller than other methods of producing steel, it's more adaptable so it can vary production between different chemistries and different requirements. And it can be located near the markets for the steel. In the electric arc furnace, the batch of steel is heated and melted with giant electric arcs. One of the main benefits of heating the steel this way is that it allows the use of almost entirely scrap steel. In fact, structural steel production in the United States averages 93% recycled scrap steel. And according to AISC, at the end of a building's life, virtually all of the structural steel is recycled into new products. This chart from Nucor's website shows the different percentages of recycled steel that they're averaging uh, in their plants. Because of the different chemistries of plate and sheet products used for manufacturing, those types of steel must be made with a contribution from iron ore, and so they have less recycled steel in them. But structural st shapes can be made almost entirely from scrap steel. Now I'll step through the steel production process flow sheet quickly. Tune in next week for the steel production and basic metallurgy session of AISC Night School 18.2 where two gentlemen from Nucor will dive deep into the steel production process and you'll learn a lot more about how this works. First, steel is loaded into the furnace in a scrap yard. Different types of scrap are mixed to provide the right uh, consistencies. That steel is melted in the electric arc furnace and then moved into the ladle metallurgy furnace. At this furnace, a uh, layer of slag is an important part of the steel production process where different alloying elements are added and elements in the slag are used to reduce impurities in the steel. The steel is then cast from a liquid into a solid in a caster and it turns into a semi-finished shape like a slab, a rectangular shape known as a bloom, or as shown here, a dog bone shaped beam blank and then stored until ready for further processing. These dog bone shapes will be carefully warmed in a reheat furnace to produce wide flange beams through a process of progressively tighter rollers that lengthen and refine the grain of the finished product. Here's a few photos of Nucor's plant rolling a W14 by 176. On the left, it starts out fairly short, fairly thick, and on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that it's elongated and lengthened to the final shape. This is a view from the operator's gondola looking at all the different variables and inputs and feedback that the equipment provides.
Specifications such as ASTM A992 provide different recipes for types of steel. The list shown here is a partial list of the requirements from that document. Carbon, as I mentioned earlier, is the fundamental ingredient that makes steel harder and stronger than iron. Many of the additional alloying elements provide benefits such as hardness, increased tensile strength, uh, better weldability or wear resistance. Other elements such as sulfur can be detrimental to the steel and need to be removed during the refining process. In addition to A992, there's a myriad of other steel chemistries that may be suitable for structural shapes and plates. HSS is made to A500 grade C, which is slightly stronger than the A500 grade B that was specified uh, recent, uh, the recent past, or ASTM 1085, which is a newer specification of 50 KSI yield material. Good old A36 is still the default steel for standard and miscellaneous eye shapes, channels, and angles. Plate can be made with A36 material, but also from A572 grade 50. You may want to check with your local fabricator to be sure, but we found that there's no surcharge for the grade 50 plate. This allows your connection material to be 40% stronger for free. The AISC manual categorizes high strength bolts into three groups. Group A for 120 KSI bolts such as A325, Group B for higher strength bolts such as A490, and Group C for a relatively new bolt that is being manufactured in Japan with a 200 KSI strength. These are all listed in the AISC specification. However, a325, A490, and those related specifications uh, have been withdrawn, and ASTM now uses F3125 to define the chemistries and properties of all of these bolts. F3125 still retains the terms grade A325 and grade A490 uh, so that the engineers can still be familiar with the type of bolt that's being produced. AISC's website provides a lookup of different steel shape availability. If you visit the website and search for, in this example, wide flange shapes, you can see the list of manufacturers in the United States who roll a certain beam size and a certain grade. If there are more check marks, it's more likely to be a common shape. However, you if you're looking for a particular beam size, you may still need to check the rolling schedule. The rolling schedule is a list that, from the steel mill that shows what shapes they're producing in, along the calendar. In this example from Nucor, you can see that W40s and W36s are being rolled this week, and next week they're planning on producing 36s, 30s, and 30s. If you need to use W33s on your project, it's too late to get them next week, and it's still possible to order material at the end of November. But in order to do that and get the first choice of mill products, the fabricator must purchase via a mill order. It's important to get an accurate advanced bill of materials for this mill order, and once it's released, the engineer of record needs to lock the member sizes and lengths, because when the fabricator orders it from the mill, that's the material that they'll have on hand, and it may be another few months before they be able to get more. If the steel is not purchased via mill order, it may come from the fabricator stock or from a service center. Fabricators might keep most of their commonly used members on hand, but it's expensive to stockpile much steel at their facilities. Steel service centers can order in bulk directly from the mill, and they can provide steel to fabricators on a shorter notice. They may sell steel already marked and cut to length so that they're ready to move into the fab shop. And now we'll take a short trip into the fabricator's shop. The job of the fabricator is to turn steel stock assemblies into assemblies for site installation. 
As written in the Code of Standard Practice, the fabricator is the main point of contact for steel supply. They usually source the steel, as well as other buyout items like bolts, and they hold the contract for the erection connection designer and the detailer. The fabricator must sequence their work with the erector to avoid storing too much material, either at the fabricator site or especially at a busy job site. I'm going to walk through a quick overview of the different stations in the fabrication shop. Uh, shops can vary in the amount of automation that they utilize. At the basic end, it may look a lot like the wood shop or metal shop class that you may have taken in high school, only with larger machines. At the higher end, the latest and greatest machines are computer controlled. I'm going to show some photos of the equipment that are provided by Vortman because the marketing pictures that they have are clean and easy to see. But if you visit the exhibition hall at the North American Steel and Structures Conference, there are many other manufacturers with lots of shiny machines. And another plug for night school session 18.3, where Chris Crosby of Cianbro will tell you more about steel fabrication from a fabricator's point of view. The first process at this fabricator shop is to cut members to length, usually using a bandsaw. Drilling holes is another process that's common at the fab shop. This machine, uh, shown in the top center, only has one spindle, but the pictures of the machine on the right-hand side show a drill that can pierce the top flange and the bottom flange and the web of the wide flange member all at the same time. There are also different spindles that can be used by the drills to either drill different size holes or countersink or drill and tap uh, the steel shape. Another way to make holes in members is by using a mag drill. This piece of equipment uses a strong electromagnet to attach itself to a steel member and then works more like a manual drill press to drill holes in the shape. If you need to make holes in an existing building or if the erector needs to make field holes, this is a common method that's used. Holes can also be punched in material. This type of equipment is called an angle master, and it both punches holes and shears angles to length to make quick work of connection angles for single or double angle shear connections. Coping is a process that's required when two members frame together, usually at a wide flange shape. Coping can be done manually with some layout lines and a plasma torch, or in this example with a, a several axis robot and a plasma torch that can rotate all around the member to be coped. This coper can not only cut notches and copes into members, it can also burn holes and cut members in into pieces. It may not be as fast as a drill, but if the material only has to be processed by one machine, it may be more efficient to burn holes with a coper rather than move it between two different stations. Similar to the coping robot, but only in two dimensions, the plasma table uses a torch to burn out shapes from a large piece of plate. These could be stiffeners or gusset plates, for example, with any sort of chamfer, quarter radius, or shape. The plasma table can also produce holes with the torch. Other plate work tables may have a torch for cutting, but a spindle for drilling holes of multiple sizes to make that process more efficient. Once all the pieces are cut and shaped and drilled, they're moved to the layout station. At this table, a shop worker assembles all the pieces to the right shape and turns them into a steel assembly. The different members are joined together with either bolts or welds. The most common weld process in the shop is a semi-automated process, either flux core arc welding, FCAW, or gas metal arc welding, GMAW. Both use wire-fed electrodes. Another process shown on the left is called submerged arc welding. 
this trolley rolls along a workpiece, for example, a plate girder webbed flange connection. At the front, a preheater warms the steel, and then a hopper feeds powdered flux onto the steel. The electric arc is submerged within that, that powder flux, and that melts the electrode wire to join the two pieces together. There are many different finish specifications depending on project requirements. Sandblasting or blasting with other material may be necessary for certain paint systems or aesthetic elements. Just like the other processes, paint can be applied automatically or manually. Steel does not need to be painted if it will be enclosed by building finishes or covered with spray-on fireproofing or concrete. Finally, the finished steel assemblies are ready to send up to site. Storage is often at a premium on a congested job site, so the steel is sequenced and lotted so it can be efficiently shipped when the erector is ready for it. And that's it. Once it's out the door, it's time to move on to the next team member in the process. But first, we need to back up and talk a little bit about the detailer. The detailer produces approval documents for structural steel based on the information provided in the ODRD's design documents. Approval documents are defined as the structural steel shop drawings, erection drawings, and embedment drawings but the ability of a detailer to provide a 3D fabrication model in addition to, or even instead of 2D design drawings, was recognized in the 2016 version of the Coder Standard Practice. The detailer is often hired by the fabricator so that he can work to the strengths of the fabricator, using welded versus bolted connections, different marking schemes, and different sequencing to make their project more efficient. And the detailer needs input from the connection designer. A quick look at some historic detailing. On these sheets, you can see all of the details are hand-drawn, they're drawn out to scale, and the drawings are fairly complex. There's a lot of information shown and packed into one sheet. One reason for that is because copying lots of sheets of paper and carrying them around in the shop was not a lot of fun. This is a blow-up of one of the details that shows a plate shown graphically in one way, but called out as three different types of plates. As shown, it's known as a 2P14 right, opposite hand, it's known as a 2P14 left, and with holes in a different location, it's known as a P16. This is another example of a historic detailed structure that's made from a bridge girder or bridge truss showing the many rivets and hole spacings required to be laid out in the shop. Modern detailing begins with the creation of a 3D BIM model. BIM stands for Building Information Modeling, and this is more than just a 3D representation of the building. It can also contain information required for the fabricator as well as information used by the erector or other parties. The full steel structure is modeled usually from scratch, but it could be based on input from the design model produced by the EOR. Phasing scheduling can be built in using user-defined attributes, and this breaks the project into manageable packages. You can even go as far as determining what pieces will fit on a truck and tracking the shipping and delivery dates piece by piece. Once the steel structure is modeled, including all of the connections, down to the last weld, secondary material like stairs and handrail, closure plates and pour stops, the computer can generate drawings that are simply a snapshot of the model. In this way, many thousands of drawings can be easily created, transmitted, and reviewed without printing a single sheet. Another major benefit of using a 3D BIM model is that you can coordinate with other trades working in 3D. If the other design members, such as the HVAC and plumbing teams, can bring 
their 3D models together into a software such as Navisworks. The owner can see what the finished product will work, look like and can identify clashes and areas that require coordination between the different parties. Part details show the information required to fabricate a single piece of steel, so like a gusset plate, a connection angle, or a beam. The term gather sheet can be used to refer to a collection of part details, but in addition to a 2D drawing, the computer can also quickly generate CNC, or computer numerical control files, or DXF files that can be loaded into a fabrication machine software that provides all the geometry the machine needs to fabricate the piece automatically. This is an example of an assembly drawing. The assembly drawing takes all of the pieces that are created and brings them together into assembled fabrications, just like we saw in the fabrication shop at the assembly table. For example, a beam with any connections and gusset plates. Assembly drawings can be quite complex. On this truss drawing, you can see the geometry of the truss, and in the blow-up, the many different dimensions between the different pieces and the work points and the layouts, as well as the welds that are required so that the fabricator knows how to connect the parts to make the truss. Direction drawings are the next piece that the detailer produces. These are the instructions for field installation. It's not a step-by-step -step drawing set like you'd find in a Lego set, but erection drawings show only what the erector needs to put the steel in the air. This is an example of an erection drawing that shows the layout of the trusses, purlins, horizontal braces, and infill beams. It also shows some field weld details and a section where field work is required. This field work was added to accommodate a late change in the design that couldn't be affected in the fab shop. The owner or the EOR is required to deliver the design documents to the detailer. When the detailer is released for construction, these design documents are expected to be frozen or locked so the detailing can proceed smoothly. The fabricator then produces the approval documents. It's becoming more and more common for the detailer to share their 3D model with the EOR and with other parties. This can facilitate the review process, helping the EOR look through the shop detail drawings, or an in-model review can actually replace the review of 2D sheets of paper. The approval documents, including the model or the details, are reviewed by the ODRD and the ODRC. This is for confirmation that the fabricator has correctly interpreted the contract documents and confirmation that the construction manager has reviewed and approved the connection details and is ready to begin fabrication. We'll talk about the approval documents a little bit more in the next section of this presentation. That next section is the connection designer. The connection designer designs connections. The connection design can either be provided in-house by the engineer of record or it can be contracted by an, uh, to another engineer by the owner, the fabricator, or the detailer. And you'll learn more about connection design in Night School 18.4 with Chad Fox from Ruby and Associates. The EOR can choose from three different options as outlined by the Code of Standard Practice for the design of each connection type. Option one, the complete connection design is shown on the structural design documents. Option two, the connection is designated to be selected or completed by an experienced detailer. And option three, the connection shall be designated to be designed by a licensed engineer. If the EOR selects option three, he must also choose between 3A and 3B, which I'll discuss further in a moment. Option one, with connection design shown on the design documents, is performed as part of the EOR's team. It's almost always used on the West Coast, especially in seismic design regions, 
where stiffness and performance of the connections affect the seismic performance of the structure as a whole. Option two, if the connections are designated to be selected or completed by the detailer, the EOR must provide loads that are to be resisted at each connection, whether LRFD or ASD is to be used, any restrictions on the type of connections permitted, and what, if any, substantiating information must be provided back to the EOR with the approval documents. Just as a reminder, it's generally discouraged to use a note requiring all beam end connections to be designed for a certain percentage of UDL. Rather, please provide the actual loads at the end of each member for efficient connection design. These loads can be provided directly on the drawings, in tables, or if using a design model, they can be embedded into the 3D model as member attributes. The intent of option two is that the detailer selects connection materials from tables. Per the commentary, this option is not intended when the practice of engineering is required. Option three for delegated connection design. Prior to 1960, connections were normally developed by the EOR, but during the 60s, fabricators like American Bridge and Bethlehem Steel were introducing new fabrication and connection methods. They're switching from rivets to bolts and welding. The fabricators actively marketed to engineers that they could perform the connection design, simplifying the work of the EOR and allowing the EOR to simply review and accept the fabricator's connection design. What are some reasons to de delegate connection design? Well, first, it can be hard. Connection design can be very specialized. It takes a different set of design references that may be different than what a typical um, building design may be available. Fabricators also have different preferences. If the connection designer is hired by the fabricator, they can take advantage of those preferences to provide economy to the project. Option three, delegated design, was finally added to the Code of Standard Practice in 2010. It's important to note that member reinforcing does not equal connection design. The EOR is required to provide the design of web openings, bearing stiffeners, doublers, and any other member reinforcement away from the connections. Member reinforcement can be costly, so it's important for fabricators to know at the time of bidding how much reinforcement will be necessary. Even if the EOR selects to delegate connection design in option three, he is still responsible for providing this information at connection locations, either in option 3A, where the EOR actually designs all the member reinforcement required, or in option 3B, where the EOR provides project-specific conceptual details and estimated quantity for bidding purposes. I'll also point out that member reinforcing is difficult and expensive, so it may be more cost effective to select a heavier member size that doesn't need to be reinforced. AISC provides a spreadsheet called Clean Columns to help you decide if that's a, a good option. Delegated connection design may only be necessary for a portion of the design. Simple shear connections might be selected from tables or might be computer designed, but more complicated connections such as bracing or truss connections are commonly ones that would be good for delegated design. The substantiating information or the information that's returned back to the EOR may vary from a signed and sealed cover letter to a full calculation package. Representative samples of the substantiating information need to be reviewed by the EOR before the preparation of a full set to make sure the connection designer is on the same page. And just a note, we've seen engineer records who insist that each sheet of the approval documents be signed and sealed by the connection engineer. The commentary to the Code of Standard Practice discourages this, as these drawings are not produced by the connection engineer, they're produced by the detailer and it may confuse the design responsibility for the finished product. This diagram attempts to describe the flow of information in the code of standard practice relative to the connection designer. 
The engineer record provides design criteria like loads and any restrictions on connection types. The connection designer, or as described in the Coder Standard Practice, the licensed engineer in responsible charge of connection design, then prepares the substantiating connection information. As I noted a minute ago, at the outset of a project, the sample set of substantiating connection information is shared with the EOR to make sure that that's going to be an appropriate set of documents. The connection designer then prepares the connection design sketches, which are incorporated by the detailer. The detailer produces approval documents, as we saw in the last section. The approval documents are required to be reviewed by the connection designer. The code of standard practice requires this because the connection designer needs to ensure that connections are incorporated properly according to his sketches. However, the ODRC and the engineer of record must also review and approve the design, as they should have the best knowledge of the building as a whole. And all official communication between the parties must happen between established lines of communication according to the contractual arrangement of the team. However, it's very often helpful for the connection designer to have a direct telephone number with the detailer and with the EOR so we can ask questions as they arise. There are many resources on, that a connection designer leans on in his work. Many of these resources are produced by AISC. Their design guide series can be found at the website noted at the top of this page. These references include information on bolts, information on welds, and here I'll also point out the design of welded structures by Omer Blodgett is a critical design reference that every office should have. It's only $25 or so, and it's available from the uh, Lincoln Arc Welding Foundation. Other reference information on, for example, simple shear connections can be found in the Steel Construction Manual. There are design guides for moment connections. There's a design guide for vertical bracing, and also one for column base plate and anchor rod design. Of course, there are many other references available that I don't have space to show here. This slide illustrates a list of things that a connection designer needs to discuss with the fabricator erector and sometimes the EOR to provide an efficient and effective design. Clearly, connection design should not be performed in a silo. Decisions need to be made related to what bolt sizes and grades will be used on a project. It's preferable to maintain as few bolt types as possible and each type being a different size. This makes it difficult for a an erector to stuff a Group A bolt into a hole that was meant for a Group B bolt. Oversized holes make it easier for the erector to get large pieces joined in the field, but standard or short slot holes provide the most strength per fastener, so that's a trade-off that you'll need to be discussed. Other connection decisions like welding, type of shear connection or moment connection preferences, and other items uh, must be discussed with the fabricator and potentially the erector to benefit the project as a whole. This again is where the knowledge of the work of the rest of the steel construction team helps to enhance the constructability of a project. Now we're ready to talk about the work that the erector provides. The erector is responsible, according to the Code of Standard Practice, for the means, methods, and safety of the erection of the st structural steel frame. We'll learn more about steel erection in Night School 18.5 with Phil Torchio of Williams Enterprises. Looking at the chapter erection, chapter section seven in the Coder Standard Practice, the code begins with a list of responsibilities of the ODRC before the erector can begin. We talked about those earlier in this presentation. You've probably heard or used the term means and methods before, but I wanted to find an official de definition, so AISC provided this description from the American Bar Association. 
Means and methods refers to the approach to or manner of construction, including the amount of labor, material, and equipment necessary to implement the selected technique adopted by the contractor to perform work. In general, a contractor's means and methods refers to the course of construction undertaken by the contractor. Erection engineering, which I'll describe in the next section, may be necessary to help the erector determine the approach and manner of construction, but the obligation is clearly on the erector to perform the work effectively and efficiently. A major portion of this section of the Code of Standard Practice defines erection tolerances. These tolerances are coordinated with the fabrication tolerances shown in Section 6.4, with other trades, and with design practices. It's nice to note that the direct analysis notional load coefficient of 0 .002 comes directly from the H over 500 maximum out of plumbness of a column in the constructed structure. These tolerances haven't changed significantly since 1959. So if it's not broken, don't fix it. The owner or engineer of record shouldn't try to change these tolerances arbitrarily, but there may be good reasons uh, for providing in contract documents different tolerances for items such as architecturally exposed structural steel or sensitive portions of the stru structure. But this can add project cost. The code provides written descriptions, summarized uh, written descriptions of the different tolerances, and these are all summarized graphically in the commentary. This is an example of the chart for column location summary that indicates a column could be as much as three inches away from the building exterior or two inches toward the building exterior as it reaches the 36th floor and above. The engineer of record needs to understand this, and the detailer and Erector need to provide for any type of adjustment that may be required for facade attachment or other appurtenances that are added to the building. The coder standard practice also provides anchor bolt tolerances. As we noted before, the ODRC is responsible for setting anchor bolts, and the code provides tolerances in section 7.5.1. These are coordinated with the recommended base plate hole sizes in the AISC steel construction manual. In essence, if the ODRC sets the anchor rods in accordance with the, the tolerances shown in the code of standard practice, and the detailer uses the recommended hole sizes for anchor rod holes and base plates, it should be possible for the erector to set the column according to tolerance. When I gave a practice version of this presentation to some members of my office, I heard a chuckle at this point because it seems to be that anchor bolt placement tolerance is a frequent issue in the field. The code of standard practice suggests that moderate amounts of reaming, grinding, welding, or cutting, and the drawing of elements into line with drift bins shall be considered to be normal erection operations. Any field modifications or error correction beyond these moderate amounts becomes an issue that needs to be dealt with in the field. Stay tuned for AISC Night School 18.7, where Jim Fisher will tell us all about different types of field fixes that are common in a steel construction project. Now I'd like to show a few photos of steel erection, courtesy of Phil Torchio. This building, erected with a tower crane topping out, uh, shows a beam being lifted into the final position on the structural steel frame. You'll notice a fir tree and some flags at the top of the beam. And you may reference a modern steel construction article for some possible explanations of using these as ceremony for topping out a steel building. These photos show one of the largest mobile cranes in the world erecting parts of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. The Manitowoc 31,000 crane is rated for 2,500 tons and can be configured with 2 million pounds of counterweight. Erectors get to play with some big toys. 
However, steel erection doesn't need to be performed with a crane. This helicopter lift was used to erect a spire on the top of the One Atlantic Center, where access in the middle of an urban downtown core was limited. It wasn't economical to bring in a crane that could reach that high in the air, so a helicopter made this final lift. Now I'll talk briefly about the erection engineer. The EOR is responsible for the structural adequacy and code compliance of the completed structure, but how does it get built? We'll learn more about the erection engineer from Ben Miller in the erection engineering presentation in Night School 18.6. But essentially, erection engineering provides an analysis of the structure at various stages of construction to ensure an adequate load path is provided at all times. Just like the relationship between the fabricator and the connection designer, it's usually more efficient for the erector and erection engineer to be on the same team so that the procedure can work to the erector's strengths. On difficult projects or tight sites, the ODRC may want to dictate an erection procedure so he can better control the schedule of on-site activities. But this needs to be specified in the contract documents as it will affect the erector's bid. According to the Code of Standard Practice, as we noticed before, the EOR shall identify the lateral force resisting system and the connecting diaphragm elements that provide for lateral strength and stability in the completed structure. I gave you an example earlier of a good statement from the commentary. The EOR shall also identify any special erection conditions, such as the use of shores, jacks, or loads that must be adjusted to set or maintain camber, position within specified tolerances, or pre-stress. These are things that uh, issues where the construction sequence can have a major influence on the stresses within a structure, but the intent of the design is not apparent from the 2D drawings or from the design model alone. The ODRC shall identify the uninstallation schedule for non-steel elements of the lateral force resisting system and the connecting diaphragm prior to bidding so that the erector knows what the schedule will be uh, for stability of the final structure. For example, the erector may need to leave temporary bracing in place until the concrete shear walls have reached sufficient strength. A lot of words on this slide, so bear with me for a moment as we review what the code says about temporary bracing. The erector shall determine, furnish, and install all temporary supports required for the erection operation. So what are the temporary supports? Well, they need to be sufficient to secure the bare structural steel framing against loads that are likely to be encountered during erection. What are the temporary supports not? The erector need not consider loads that result from the performance of work by others, nor those that are unpredictable, such as loads due to hurricanes and several other low probability events. Any loads that are due to follow on trades must be identified to the erector by the ODRC and if the temporary bracing of the erection engineer or if the erector needs to be increased, uh, coordination will have to be provided. Finally, temporary supports that are required for the support of loads caused by non structural steel elements will be the responsibility by others. Other than gravity load, the erection engineer is mainly concerned about wind, sometimes ice, but the lateral load imposed on a building is generally uh, based on the wind. ASCE 37, Design Loads on Structures During Construction, provides a method to reduce the wind speed to account for the risk of high wind events during a construction period versus the risk of high wind events during a 50-year project lifespan. Wind pressure is based on the square of wind speed, so an 80% reduction factor for a project lasting six weeks to one year reduces the total pressure on the building uh, to about two-thirds of the pressure used by the EOR to design the structure. The structure during erection may experience less wind force than the final enclosed building. However, 
the total base shear due to wind during construction could be similar to or even much higher than the wind on the final enclosed building. The shape factor CF accounts for square-sided members collecting more wind force than their projected area would be indicated. As wind blows around a wide flange shape, you could multiply the wind pressure by the projected area, but the shape itself is actually going to catch more wind and the force on it will be higher. Shielding is also a concept that is limited by the available design codes. Even though you may have 20 floor beams all in a row, ASCE only allows a small reduction on any beam past the third. So each and every one of these beams is still collecting a great deal of wind. According to the hurricane, according to the code of standard practice, as we just saw, hurricane loads are not required to be considered. However, ASCE 37 treats hurricanes Excuse differently. Me. Excuse me, Drew. Yeah. Drew, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties there. Okay. I think the audio is cleared up now, but um, can you go back? Uh, you go back to just to the bottom half of this slide, if you would not, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, starting. Your, your last few comments there, I think, is where we lost you there. Okay, certainly. Thank you. Uh, wind collected by the open structure can be much higher than wind on the final enclosed building. The shape factor, CF, accounts for square-sided members collecting more wind force than their projected area would indicate. Shielding is also a concept that is limited by the design codes. Even though you may have more floor beams um, lined up all in a row, ASCE only allows a 20% reduction on any beam past the third. So each and every one of these beams is still collecting a great deal of wind. Per the code of standard practice, hurricane loads are not required to be considered because they're a low likelihood event. However, ASCE 37 provides a wind reduction outside the hurricane season, but during July through October allows 115 mile an hour wind speed near the coast, quote, provided additional bracing is prepared in advance and applied in time before the onset of an announced hurricane. The likelihood of a hurricane affecting the project site might be small, but the destruction of a direct hit could be large. Once a hurricane is announced, preparations are generally made to evacuate the area, not send in additional workforce to erect temporary bracing. For this reason, it's important to communicate early on in the project with the erector, the owner, and the ODRC, ideally before bidding, to ensure everyone is aware of the risks and costs of hurricane preparedness. The process of erection engineering can be broken into three different types of tasks. Structure stability, which is the analysis of a partially completed structure at each stage of the procedure. Element stability, which is the analysis of the installation of a major element of the structure. And staged construction, which is looking at the accumulation of dead load stresses that are locked in as additional portions of the structure are constructed. The structural stability portion of erection engineering may also be known as erection staging. Each stage of analysis is looked at as a separate structural analysis. The load path, especially the lateral load path, might be much different than what's found in the final design. Temporary bracing is provided, usually with wire ropes, until enough of the structure is complete to handle the load. One of the questions that we usually get asked by the erector is, how far can steel erection proceed ahead of the deck? Steel deck provides a diaphragm that transfers lateral load from members to the lateral force resisting system in the building. Concrete slab on metal deck is used for floors in the final structure, but until the concrete is placed and set, the erector must rely on the strength of the deck itself as the diaphragm. This shows an illustration of an X brace frame used for stability of a structure and the wire rope in the uh, in the real world. You can see the rope is wrapped around the columns and is tightened with a turnbuckle 
to provide some pre-stress and to pull the columns tightly together. Element stability is that aspect of erection engineering that looks at a truss or girder or other large fabricated assembly under the hook and review of the stability of that assembly before releasing the crane. The question to be answered here is how many infill members or how many additional supports need to be added to make sure that this piece of the structure will be stable before the crane is released. Stage construction analysis is another piece of erection engineering. Highly indeterminate buildings may have multiple load paths. This is especially important on cable supported structures where construction operations and sequencing or the cable tensioning sequence can greatly affect stresses within the structure. If some of the cables are pulled too tight too quickly, they can induce stresses that are far beyond what the engineer of record assumed in his analysis. And finally tonight, I'd like to mention briefly the aspects of quality control in a structural steel building. Both the fabricator and the rector are required by the Code of Standard Practice to maintain a quality control program. However, the Code of Standard Practice doesn't say much about what that quality control program is. It really references back to the AISC specification, Chapter N, which addresses the minimum requirements for quality control, quality assurance, and non-destructive testing. You'll learn much, much more about quality control in Night School 18.8 .8 with Larry Kruth. Specification Chapter N provides guidance for steel inspection and a quality program for all fabricators and erectors to use. This is a new chapter in the specification as of 2010, but the requirements aren't necessarily new. It just pulls together all of the quality requirements necessary for steel construction into one place. And the best part of having Chapter N is that the EOR just has to specify AISC 360, the specification, and the Code of Standard Practice to ensure a consistent quality program is required. I wanted to find out what the difference was between QC and QA, so I opened up Google and found ISO 9000, which seems to be an authority on the subject. Their position is that QC is a part of quality management focused on fulfilling quality requirements, and QA is a part of quality management focused on providing confidence that quality requirements will be fulfilled. Maybe we have some quality experts listening, but I'm just a structural engineer. That really doesn't make any sense to me, and I've read it I don't know how many times. Luckily, it doesn't matter. Chapter N provides its own definition that's to be used in the context of steel construction. Chapter N says that quality control shall be provided by the fabricator and erector, and quality assurance shall be provided by others. That's the main distinction. Coordinated quality control and quality assurance is permitted if approved by the engineer of record or the AHJ, the building code official. In this, state, in this case, the QA inspector can rely on observations by the QC inspector for any tasks that overlap between the two requirements. Chapter N uses the terms observe versus perform. Observe, the inspector shall observe these items on a random basis, and perform, the inspector shall perform these tasks for each welded joint or bolted connection. This is similar to the terms continuous and periodic in IBC's tables of special inspections. IBC only provides tables for joists, concrete, soils, and foundations, and all of the requirements for steel construction are contained in Chapter End. Those tables as shown in Chapter End do look similar to the IBC tables. Tables are provided for inspection tasks prior to, during, and after welding, bolting, and NDT, non-destructive testing requirements. Here you can see some of the requirements are listed as periodic, I'm sorry, perform, and some are listed as observe where the two letters are the same, 
coordinated QC and QA can be provided. Well, in conclusion, I hope I've helped identify some of the members of the steel team who produced the steel building, from the mill through topping out. I've described the basic responsibilities of each of these parties and the relationships to one another as defined by the AISC Code of Standard Practice. The next seven sessions of AISC Night School 18 will help you to understand in much more detail what each of these members does and how they do it. No matter which part of the team you belong to, knowing more about all of the rest of the process will help you prepare your work product more effectively for the team. Remember, constructability is a process where input is gathered from all members of the team to make the project as a whole a more efficient and effective one. Thank you for your participation, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Night School 18. And I'll turn it over to Brent for questions and a few polling questions. Okay, thanks, Drew. All right, um, we do have a few questions from the audience, Drew. Um, but before we get to those, we're going to do a couple polling questions for our audience. Um, if you do have a question, feel free to type that into the chat uh, at any time here, and we'll do our best to get to those before we uh, before time's up this evening. All right, so let's do our first polling question. Uh, and the question is this. We just hit on this topic. Uh, tables? of inspection requirements for steel construction can be found where? Maybe find in the IBC, ASCE 7, AISC 360 Chapter N, or AISC's Code of Standard Practice, or E, both in Chapter N and the Code of Standard Practice, both C and D. What's the correct answer? Go ahead and click on your answer you think is most correct. Again, the table of inspection requirements for steel construction can be found where? Give you about 10 more seconds if you want to submit an answer. For those of you that are, uh, are using the app on your phone or possibly uh, uh, iPad, you can just submit it through the chat. Okay, let's close this poll and look at the results, Drew. Uh, interesting, so uh, close to half of the audience chose C, Chapter N in AISC 360, and about half of the audience chose E, uh, which was C and D. Uh, well, I right don't answer? know if that means that the audience wasn't listening or if I wasn't talking well enough. It might be the latter. Um, the AISC Code of Standard Practice only specifies that the fabricator and the erector must follow a quality control plan. It doesn't specify what that plan is or how it needs to be enacted. AISC 360, the specification, Chapter N, is the part of the document that actually describes the testing requirements and provides tables, which are similar to IBC, for the different tasks that must be performed. So the correct answer is C. Okay, all right. Well, uh, hopefully you got that right. If you didn't, you got a chance to redeem yourself on this next one. All right, next question. Constructability should be considered when, A, at the beginning of the project, B, at 90% design documents, C, during the bidding process, D, throughout design, fabrication, and erection, or E, once the building is complete. Let people submit their answers. Again, the question is about constructability. When should we be considering constructability? A, at the beginning of the project. B, at 90% design documents. C, during bidding. D, throughout design, fabrication, and erection, or E, once the building is complete. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. I think everyone submitted that wanted to. 
All right, and overwhelmingly people chose D, throughout design, fabrication, and erection. What do you think, Drew? Correct. Although it's important to consider constructability at the beginning of a project, that's not the only time that cons constructability is important. Throughout the entire design, fab, and erection stage of a construction project, constructability uh, is still an important concept and can provide valuable input to those processes. So the correct answer is D. All right, great. Okay, let's get to some questions with the time we have remaining. Um, all right, the first question is, um, as an erection engineer of record, do you have to check every lift on the project? Um, generally, no. As an erection engineer, uh, typically the lifts that we review are the uh, those that qualify as critical lifts, and that depends on the criteria that's specified by the owner, but generally two crane lifts are critical lifts. Uh, any lift over 75% of the crane capacity is a critical lift, and any of these, um, these lifts require extra planning and paperwork to make sure that everything goes according to plan and that the, um, the all the I's have been crossed and the T's have been dotted. Okay. Um, talked a little bit about model sharing. Is model sharing becoming more common? And are liability issues being addressed when it comes to model sharing amongst the EOR, the fabricator, and the detailer? On the first part of that question, I would say yes, definitely. Um, model sharing can provide lots of benefits for all of the users involved in the model sharing. But on the second part of the question, liability, um, there is guidance available. Uh, I know the North American Steel Structures Conference, the Steel Conference, has had a couple of presentations from teams that are using model sharing exclusively. And what they have done is set up uh, meetings with the owner at the very outset of the project to help determine what method they're going to use for the sharing, what the relationships between the parties are going to be, and who owns various stages of the models. So guidance is out there, but I'm sure it's lagging behind uh, just the ability to share models and to gain benefit from doing so. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to go to slide 109. Uh, someone was asking about this project. Uh, is this uh, project shown here, is that in Detroit? And can you tell us a little um, bit Yes, with an asterisk. It's in Greater Detroit. Uh, this is a tight arch bridge that carries I-94 over Telegraph Avenue. Um, and it was constructed with a tension tie beneath Telegraph uh, Road, so underneath what you can see here. That pulls the two ends of the arch together. That, coupled with the tightening sequence of the cables, made this a very complex project that required in-depth erection engineering. Great. So uh, safe to assume you were the, uh, did the erection engineering on here. Was was Ruby and Associates the EOR as well, or no? Uh, no, Ruby performed the erection engineering, and I think construction was by CA Hull. I'm not sure offhand who the designer was. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to uh, slide 116. Um, there's a question about the image on the left. Um, can you provide more information on what is being performed in that image? Oh, definitely. Um, Phil Torchio can probably tell you more about it in Night School 18.5, quick teaser. Uh, but this shows a wide flange column being field spliced with a CJP weld in the flanges. Uh, essentially, the gloves on the left show you the iron worker who's using a welding torch to fill up that entire groove with weld metal. 
and as big as these column flanges are, that connection that you see right there could take two iron workers uh, an entire shift or even a shift and a half to complete. All right. Okay. Um, next question. We'll try to get to a few more here. Um, what uh, of the of the contractual arrangements you discussed at the beginning? What would you recommend as the most optimal contractual arrangement? And who in the chain has the input and say in determining what the arrangement will be for a project? Um, I don't think I can suggest, I'm going to switch to slide 13 here, I don't think I can suggest an optimum arrangement. Um, generally, some of the successful teams that we've been on have been led by a construction manager uh, who also has maybe erection in-house, but they're kind of in the driver's seat on those projects to determine what the contractual relationship is. Uh, owners are generally not as sophisticated or their main business is um, something outside the construction industry, so they're not familiar with the different types of arrangements, but a uh, construction manager is intimately familiar with how this works, so they might be the best party to uh, suggest what might be good on a certain project. Okay. Um. Next question um, is, what are the main differences of tasks between the detailer and connection designer? Um, well, the connection designer provides structural engineering. They are a PE. Um, they provide the engineering design. The detailer takes input from the EOR who's designed the structure, and they take information from the connection designer, usually in the form of sketches or tables and maps that show where the connections need to live. And they just put that all into their 3D model to create um, the, the fabrication details or the approval documents that are going to be required. So there's no engineering that happens on the detailer's side. I hope that answered the question enough. If you want to ask it again or if you want to follow up later, feel free to send an email. Okay. I think that was a great answer. Thanks, Drew. Um, and let me, uh, let's try to get to one more here. Um, in your opinion, are, are EORs becoming more responsive to the efforts to coordinate constructability? I would say probably. I don't have a good um, a good feel for this, but it seems like uh, we're seeing projects uh, as, as we're bidding for connection design or for erection engineering jobs. We are fortunate to look at uh, many designs from EORs, and we're starting to get more. Uh, projects where the EOR is showing the forces on each individual member instead of tables, and sometimes some more constructible details. So I think the efforts are helping, but I don't have a good way of measuring. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Drew, for your thoughts on those questions that came in tonight. And um, we are out of time, so if you did not get your question answered this evening, uh, we will follow up uh, with Drew and uh, provide a response for you in the coming week.